We've talked about this one in the past, but it's time it finally gets its own review and documentation. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. Yes, we're gonna talk about this crazy quilty two-piece top deluxe today. This was birthed under the Norlin era ownership of Gibson, roughly 1969 through 1985. Go ahead and take a good look at this. And now take a good look at one of the very first Les Paul Deluxe ever made. Obviously, a lot of things changed over the course of production of the Les Paul Deluxe. Most noticeably, when you get into the 80s, it becomes a little bit more popular to find a two-piece top on Gibsons. Technically, the Norlin era is all about three-piece tops. If you were to strip away that gold finish off an original or you got like a natural example, a two-piece top Gibson in this era actually is quite uncommon. But again, the further into the 80s you go, the more possible it is, especially with the introduction of like the Heritage series. So if you've always wanted a deluxe in your collection, that's kind of the purpose of this video is to have a searchable title so people actually learn that these things are out there because they're so unique. Because let's face it, deluxe are not the most popular Les Paul model out there. They've got our mini humbuckers instead of P90s or full-sized humbuckers. This era of guitars is well known for being heavy. And on top of that, they're much more expensive than Gibson's current original collection deluxe. And I won't lie to you, some of the modern day production ones are just as good. However, I don't think you'll find this coming out of Gibson USA anytime soon. So these are like the little brother model that not enough people know about. And it's also worth mentioning that P90 pickups fit directly in the route of mini humbuckers. So if you don't like them, you can always switch out to P90s. Besides our beautiful top, what makes these 80s ones a little bit more desirable overall, depending on how you feel about things? Their specs are more traditional. So the thing about the Golden Era Deluxe is most of them have a pancake body construction. That starts to phase away around 1976, so we actually do have a solid mahogany body. However, usually you still will find a small maple layer between the maple top and the mahogany body that you can only see in our pickup cavities. We'll have to see if that's still here in 85 as I'm still documenting examples to figure out exactly when that stopped. Another spec you might like is you do not have a three piece maple neck anymore. Again, that transition was 75 to 76 and lasted till about 82. And even before that, you still had a three piece mahogany neck. This is one piece mahogany. You don't have any volume it's a relatively traditional guitar and on top of our awesome top you also have to remember that they've brought back the dish carve a little bit by this point in time it's the heritage series where they start to dish them a little bit more now i'm not saying this is the craziest dish carve ever but for the norlin era which ends after 1985 it's not too bad if you've always liked the idea of having a deluxe in your collection, but some of the quirky specs turned you off, there are some really beautiful ones out there, including this one. They're not incredibly common, but they're not so rare that you'll never see one on the market. But in case you're new to my show and you're curious of how I got this, it's actually for sale in my shop on consignment right now, but I initially purchased this guitar about a year and a half ago, trying to get my Brazilian Rosewood Les Paul Custom back. But he was a collector who was very proud of his stuff, and if he was going to sell one of his prized Les Paul, he needed to sell all of them, you know, rip it off like a band-aid. And I'm glad I did, but I had a viewer of the show who consigned a lot of stuff with me stop by. He fell in love with this deluxe, and it was relatively inexpensive then because it needed a minor truss rod repair, which he had done. Basically just needed a washer added under it. It's good for many years now. So since he was here to sell stuff, we actually just worked out a trade. I got a The Paul reissue, which I'm glad to have in my collection. I'm a big fan of The Pauls. And this one has a slightly flamey body, which most of them don't have. So so I thought that was kind of cool. Let me know if I need to re-review this model in 2024 to see how it stood up since it's released in late 2018 for 2019 then I got one of these zoot suits. Maybe not my favorite zooter I've ever had, but I wanted to make sure I had one in my collection before I got priced out. So he had it for like six to eight months, and the next time he dropped by to pick up his consignment check, he just decided, eh, you know, I think I'd rather have the money. These mini humbuckers aren't for me, which is sadly the fate of most of these deluxe. Not everybody loves the minis. Some sets are good, some sets are not, but let's go ahead and throw this one on the workbench to document its individual parts and specs, and then see how I feel about these particular pickups.
And we're back! I'm really glad I took the time to document this one. Not only did it clean up beautifully, but it appears these two-piece top ones are routed a little bit different than other deluxe. Now first glance, you just might think, ah, oh, that looks like your regular base plate. What are you talking about here, Trogly? Here's the thing. I can't figure out how they mounted this, because usually it's two diagonal screws or somewhere, and I looked underneath these felt pads, it wasn't there. Further looking, I don't see our usual channel routes. All I see is this small circular one. And then when we go into the bridge pickup, we see the exact same thing. Usually we would see like some sort of a route that connects these two right here. This one again just has that small mouse hole. Seems this other mouse hole goes underneath the routing so we don't actually see it. And then maybe they line up there. I could not find out how to get rid of these base plates. So I don't know if they glued them on or what they did. But looking over in this corner, we can confirm it is a full thickness top. And there is no second maple layer. So by 85, they were done with all the pancake stuff. It's just a mahogany back. This pickup has the Tim Shaw date style, so it's in April of 1981. But with this being an 85, that seems kind of strange. Then you come over here and it says March 1st appears to be 1980. 1980 is the last year that they used this date stamp style before switching over to our new one. Have these been replaced at one point in time? In my opinion, no, but we'll talk a little bit more on that in the back control cavity. These deluxe might have been produced until about 1985, but once 1980 hits, they drop off. They're not all that common. The 83, 84, 85 deluxe, I'm sure they didn't make that many in a year. So the few that they did make, it would make sense that they were just trying to use up old parts. Our pickup ratings within the circuit, 6.17k ohms in the bridge, 6.13 in the neck, and the middle just for fun, 3.07. Next up we have the knobs. After about 1985, knobs stop aging because they changed the materials. However, I still believe these knobs to have been replaced at one point in time. We've got a lot of cracking around the shafts. And while this is definitely an original style, you would see some deluxe used in this era. They don't quite look the part to me, so let's err on the side of caution and say they've been replaced. Another plastic item that has been replaced is our switch tip. It doesn't look right due to the rounded edge. Thankfully, it matches the color of all the other plastics. Most people probably wouldn't even notice. Moving on to our bridge and tailpiece. Got a regular Nashville style one. They were made by Schaller in Germany. You're wondering what the big difference is between ABR1 and Nashville. Nashvilles have those studs within the body, whereas an ABR1 just has a singular screw mount. Next we have our tailpiece. It's full weight. That's not the casting mark you usually see, so let's just go ahead and say this might have been replaced. However, there are some exceptions to the rule. This is a gorgeous example. It cleaned up pretty good, but I don't want you to buy it thinking, oh yeah, it's mint condition. No, it's got scratches, it's got impressions. This is definitely player's grade, but it hides most of them pretty well. You can see the nicks and dings as well as your beautiful top here. Looks like somebody used a setup tool that kind of marred the finish. Got impressions down here, nicks and dings, again your replaced knobs. And then if you wanted to remove the pickguard, you do have a pickguard impression. Then slightly below your pickguard, you've got some sort of a cut. So this is what you'd be working with if you wanted to take that pickguard off. Here's what that guard looks like. Nice and clean. But moving on from our two-piece maple top and one-piece mahogany body, we've got the one-piece mahogany neck with the rosewood fretboard. I just conditioned the fretboard, we did a mild fret polish, made this thing look pretty good. That was the one down thing about this one, is it was kind of dirty when I first got it, so it's nice that it finally got the attention it deserves. We do have the cowboy cord fretting area, where, especially on that second fret, you might want to level recrown depending on how picky you are with your setup. Is it terrible as is? No, but they definitely have somewhere to be aware of. Looking at this lighting, it looks like we do have a little bit of fingernail wear here. It's your typical 24 3 quarter inch scale with a 12 inch fretboard radius, measuring 1.7 inches at the nut and 2.05 at the 12th. The first fret neck depth of 0.84 and by the 10th, 0.95. Here's that neck profile at the first fret and the 12th fret. Just nice and rounded. It's a C-shaped neck. It's more so on 60s territory. But here you can also see the fret sprout. That's what cracks the binding on most Gibsons after a year or two. So is it a cosmetic eyesore? A little bit, but you get used to it. But it's much better than having your hand poked by frets. Because it might show that fret sprout has occurred, but it prevents the negative effects from happening. Here's another unique spec about the later 80s deluxe. The headstocks go back to normal. Headstock does have some beautiful checking to it. Nothing too crazy. And then you've got some nicks and dings along the edge. And even the Les Paul model silkscreen is a, a little this way, but that always slightly varies. 
So he took it to his luthier and he said he evaluated it and said this is one of the ones where you just have to put a washer underneath it and then you should get some more adjustment room out of it. When you have a lot of threads sticking out the top of your truss rod nut on a Gibson style truss rod, there's a few things that can be happening, but mainly your truss rod is anchored down here and it's compressing the wood. Other times it can just kind of slip. So it really depends what's going on here. If you have to rip your fretboard off or something like this will suffice. I would still categorize this as limited adjustability. If you're a collector and are going to keep this in a constant climate and you only need to use the truss rod sparingly for seasonal adjustments, yeah, you're gonna be fine. But if you wanna take this and tour it around the world in drastic temperature and humidity changes, maybe this is not the best candidate for that. The important thing to look for on guitars like these is that the neck hasn't like twisted this way. This one's perfectly straight. And it's been adjusted completely flat, not that you can really see that on camera. I was able to get the action really low on it too. Here's a look at the cover itself, just reads Deluxe. But I was really excited to clean the back of this one because there's always been some flame figuring playing peekaboo over here, as well as on the side of the guitar right here. And the polishing process brought out even more of that. I'll use my phone here to kind of exaggerate it. It's got some figuring to it. It's a nice little special feature that not all of these will have. It matches your beautiful quilty top. You don't find this figuring in the mahogany as often in this era. We've got buckle worming, scratches. I didn't see anything that were like really went deep into the finish or anything. Most of this is just clear coat. This would probably be a pretty impressive natural back if you were crazy enough to want to refinish it. And we do have the return to tradition over here with the thin binding in the cutaway so you can see the maple cap exposed. Take a quick look around the edges. Yeah, there's some more of that flame figuring we were talking about. And by our strap buttons. Here's a really peculiar thing. So looking at the wiring in here, everything seems untouched. However, this pickup has actually come unsoldered from the pot. That's the bridge pickup. Our neck pickup looks completely fine. We have an 83 dated pot there. This one's an 84. This one's a little bit too hard to read, but it's probably 83. Typically these two match and then these two. There we go. That's a better connection. We've got a strap button down here and one up here. We do have a little bit of finish rub through on the edge from a strap. Then up here on the neck, I don't want to call it a gouge, even though that's what it looks like. You really don't even feel it unless you're going at it with your nail. Feels like a scuff of some sort, but I was unsuccessful in polishing it off. Then if you follow the light, you can see there are some impressions on the neck. And you've got your typical lacquer shrinking around the nut. Maybe even a little bit more so on the base side, and you can see it along your headstock for a heavily played guitar. Now it appears this originally had Klusen style tuners on it, but somebody swapped it out for Schaller's. Now normally, I'm a big fan of the Schaller M6 tuners, but this set is not the best. This tuner has a, a little bit of grinding going on when you use a speed winder. Now tuning it up regularly, are you really going to notice it? No. But a side of our headstock here was bumped up against something. The side's a bit more minor. But our serial number dates to 1985, 126th day of the year, 589th in production, Nashville built. Here's another interesting thing. You see that? That's the circular route. So that tells you this body was made before they switched over to the CNC machines. So this was likely a new old stock body of parts that they were trying to use up and might not be constructed the exact same as other deluxe in this era. Kind of similar to my 1986 blue Les Paul Artisan. Now where do these bodies come from? Kalamazoo. They officially closed that down in 1984 so they slowly moved everything up and some of the very early custom shop guys were being hired at this point so Randy was saying they would show off on some of these pieces. Does that mean that this is one of those show-off pieces? I'm not exactly sure, but the rest of it does appear to be true. But this lighting helps us show the figuring in the body a bit better. The other cool thing about this being an old stock body is weight relief started in 1982. So this is an example of a solid body 85, which you don't find many of. Now let's do a black light test here. You can see somebody's sweat has absorbed into the finish. Other than that, everything's looking pretty good on the top. All of the other plastics are glowing the way I would expect to see. Here's a quick look at the headstock. Back of the body looks fairly good, just a little bit of the clear coat worn. Sides are looking okay. Nothing out of the ordinary anyway. Now that mystery area here under black light looks more like a series of impressions. Maybe that's why it feels raised, because the lacquer bumped up in those areas. Then of course we've got some clear coat wear on the back of the neck and more sweat absorption. But no breaks, cracks, or repairs to report on.
But as per usual, these things are heavy. 10 pounds, 9.7 ounces. Let's go ahead, plug it in, and hear how it sounds. So there we go, there's the brightness that the mini humbuckers are known for. Now I have adjusted their height a little bit, so it's not as bright as it could be, but I find finger picking is really sweet and mellow on these. <laughs> combination of the slightly darker tone that you get with your fingers with the brightness of the pickups it works incredibly well i've also found some picks have a darker tone but i just love that middle position the bridge has a roundedness to it when you use a darker pick This guitar is inspiring me to play a little bit differently. I like it. And I'm curious, does it still rock?
Now that we know all about this very interesting two-piece quilt top Les Paul Deluxe, where are my final thoughts? I'm glad I just decided to randomly review this guitar one day because we found a lot more secrets under the hood. Now, can I guarantee that all two-piece top deluxe happens to have the new old stock body? No, I cannot, not at this time anyways. But I personally thought this was a great sounding deluxe. If you want full on humbuckers, yeah, maybe it's not exactly the same, but if you go into it with the right mindset, knowing that they're going to be bright and adjust your playing accordingly, this could be a nice tool to get you out of your rut, which is exactly what this guitar kind of helped me do today. The previous owner was saying he was getting some microphonic squeals out of these pickups. I think it just depends on the type of distortion you have. I have just like a little bit more of an overdrive and I wasn't getting any of that. And ironically, these pickups were a little bit quieter than usual. I typically have to turn all my fluorescent lights off or the signal's just too loud to record, but this one, I could actually leave them on and it wasn't too bad. So your results may vary depending on your setup. The only thing I would say bad about this guitar is it's kind of heavy, <laughs> but that comes with the territory of this era. All right, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed. If you're interested in being the next owner of this one, again, it's on consignment in my shop. You can find it on Reverb or my website. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you guys tomorrow on the next one. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.